Carolyn Seitz. I'm Gail Sims. And we welcome you to Mount Oval. We're glad that you're here with us today. Mount Oval was built in 1832 by William Rennick, and he drove cattle from here to Baltimore and Philadelphia. Each cow lost about 200 pounds, but he still made a lot of money at the time, enough to build this beautiful home. So welcome, and we'll take you inside. Our story begins with William Rennick, which I just said, and he purchased this in 1825 and built this beautiful house in 1832. He also built a smokehouse and a big red barn that's outside. In 1860, he sold this to Jacob Ludwig, who's above our fireplace as well, but Jacob never lived here. He gave it to his son, Daniel, and his new wife, Julia Steely Ludwig, in 1863. We actually have the original furnishings that they bought in Cincinnati on their honeymoon um, here in our honeymoon suite, and we will show that to you. They came up on the canal. These two had four children, the youngest of whom is Elizabeth. Elizabeth then gets the farm in 1915 and renovates it because um, Daniel and Julia left the farm for about 20 years, so there were some tenants here. So when Elizabeth got it, she took the inner urban, which is now in the Kingston, was on the Kingston Pike. She got off, she walked three miles over here to see about the renovations, then got back on that inner urban, went back and took care of her aging father at the time, who was Daniel. She wanted to bring her father out here before he died. So she brought him out here on December 1st, 1915, and he died on New Year's Eve in the very bed that he brought up from, from Cincinnati for his honeymoon. Elizabeth then um, marries, get this up here for you. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth marries Bernard Young, who was a local farmer, and together then they ran Mount Oval for the rest of their lives. Um, Bernard had an eight-year-old Net niece named Mary Ruth Tolbert. Mary Ruth's story was that she was orphaned by age five and she lived with an older sister and then the sister got married so she came to Mount Oval at age eight and we'll talk about that later. So Mary Ruth was wonderful and here she is in her aging years. She lived in this house until she was 97 and so then she's our benefactor and donor. She gave it to the Pickway County Historical Society and we are thrilled to have it. Let me tell you a little bit about this room. Yeah. It has various names. Sometimes it's the living room, the parlor, the grand hall. It's 25 by 25. Um, all the woodwork in here is made of walnut, probably from the farm. It was painted because in 1832, if you had money, you could paint. And so all this walnut has always been painted. Please notice the transoms above the door. They're called sunburst transoms. As far as we know, all the glass in the house is still original from 1832. There are um, things above the windows. Those were added later. They're from the 1890s. They are actually metal hmm. cornices. Wow. This house has six fireplaces. The most decorative fireplace is here in the living room. Okay. You'll notice the Chinese motif. All of this was inlaid by hand and the three obelisk, this long one and these two. All the fireplaces when they were original were opened. This kind of insert was put in probably in the 40s and you'll notice that all the hearths in the house are painted red. That was what you did in the 1940s as well. Hmm. So the house we like to uh, show as a living history rather than from a certain time. This is always fun. We always ask people what is this and most people don't know. But it's one of the things in the house, it's called a spiller because it held the big matches for the fireplace and kind of spilled out. Huh, that's fun. We have many, many things in the house that uh, obviously have been here a long time. From the Rennick period, the 1832 group are all the mirrors and these candelabras. There's a set, two on the mantel, three, three some here, one's made into a lamp, and we have two on a back table as well. Some of the other furnishings, and most of the other furnishings, were from the Ludwig era, such as this desk. 
And Mrs. Ludwig's mother had that set tea that came over from another her farm. Which is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. The favorite chair here was Mary Ruth. She added it as she dug the robes from some of her friends. Uh, Mary Ruth was a professor at Ohio State University of Music. And um, she was very dynamic. She wasn't very tall, so she's a little bit short. And so she really ruled the roost at Ohio State when she was there. She started the Fierce Musicals. We have people who visit the house who are in some of these musicals. And one of the things that she did that's very honorable is she wrote uh, a book, co-authored books of music. This whole series is called This Is Music. She wrote it with teacher manuals and it was used in our schools throughout Ohio and throughout the United States. Uh, and this was written in the 60s. Very colorful. Yes. Uh, some of the books, that I, music in the second grade one, I was told was actually written by some of the students. And a lot of the songs that are in here are from international, from other countries. She was one of the first people to do that. She traveled and then brought music back. So some of the things that we know from other countries that we learned as children might be in these books as well. Uh, one of the features that's in this house is kind of different for the time. Is this is a key door. Okay. As we go to the other rooms, you'll see the black boxes, which would have been part of the times. But this has a key, and that, of course, costs more money to do. Gotcha. To have some uh, keysmith come in and make that hmm. as well. Pride and joy in this room is Mary Ruth's piano from Ohio State University. Uh, she had an apartment in Columbus and then came down here on weekends. And when she uh, retired from Ohio State University, the movers brought this piano to us. And she played it up until the very end, and her very end, and then she offered it for recitals for Studio One students. So lots of people came out here for recitals as well. And she loved having people in her house, and she would entertain by playing the piano. Wow, that would be really neat to have, have something in here like that. That would be amazing. So uh, people sometimes uh, mistakenly, but I think it got around some years ago that this, that Thomas Jefferson was a friend to uh, Mr. Rennick and about this house. That's not true. We checked with Monticello. That's not true. Mr. Jefferson was definitely a friend of Mr. Worthington, who has a Dina in Chillicothe, but not here. But I think part of the misconstruction is that this is a architect's drawing from a guy named Gibbs. And we were told that Thomas Jefferson was going to build a guest house using this. But this is the beginning of the uh, architectural drawing that Mr. Rennick used. So in this house, there are ten, four or three 10 by 10 rooms. You're going to visit those. But this side of the house is totally different. And there's an upstairs that he added as well. So that's the only thing that sometimes we get confused about. Hmm. So there is no connection between this and Thomas Jefferson other than that drawing. And Mr. Jefferson never built that because he, his wife inherited popular farms, so they didn't need it. Gotcha. So this is one of the few houses that we know of, maybe the only house in America, but if there's somebody has another one, let us know, that has a drover's room. Because we said that Mr. Rennick drove cattle from here uh, to Baltimore and Philadelphia markets in the early 1800s, made wealth. So when he built this house, he actually attributed one whole room to the head driver or drover. The drover at that time not only drove the cattle or was in charge of driving cattle, but then he became the top breeder for the farm. So let's go there, and Gail will show you. We're going out to one of our three porches. What do you want me to do? Now I got to speak as well as Carol. So we're just going to the drover's room first. Okay. Where, where do you? Go ahead. Okay. This is the drover's room that Mr. Rennick had when the house was built. He wanted a private room so that they could come and go uh, without disturbing the family. Uh, it was, um, they drove the cattle from up from here. They went to, uh, when they got to the Ohio River, they crossed the cattle on, on, on barges and took one up to New York, Baltimore. and. Um, when he was at age 28, uh, while his father, his father and his uncle, his father George and his uncle Felix started the cattle business here in uh, Pickaway County. And then they also started the cattle uh, 
dri driving. Uh, uh, he had his first cattle drive at the age of 15. And uh, as a result of that, he had nerve problems the rest of his life. Uh, hmm. So uh, at the age of 28, he was a very wealthy man from the business and the cattle driving. Uh, he uh, had this house built, and he and his wife lived here for 33 years, and then he sold it to Mr. Um, Butwick in 1960. So this is the Drover's room, and we have maps here of the, uh -huh. of the cattle drive. Here's the maps of the cattle drive. See, okay. I told you, I get nervous. No, don't get nervous. Okay. I can just the cattle drive, and these are his, when he had auctions. These are um, posters of his auction sales. Wow, that's neat. And then we have the Indian trails over here. Okay. And the mounds. The Circleville. And then Circleville uh, as, as the circle. I have that in my office. Oh, cool. Uh, it's not, of course, they're old ones. <laughs> yes. But in uh, 1931, um, when Mary Ruth Talbert was getting ready to go to college, they started a day camp here, and it went for five years. That's how she got her money to start to college. And this room was used as the washroom at that time. Hmm. And then Mary Ruth put it back as the drover's, original drover's room. Amazing. Then we'll go out to the porch here. We have barrel uh, ceilings, which is very unusual. And especially for that time. Right. And uh, there is a seam, an open seam on each end of the of the ceiling and that allowed air flow so the um, air could get through and oh, okay. the wood wouldn't, wouldn't get moist and right, rot. Right, right there, yes. right? Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Very unusual from that time. That porch, of course, was open and sometime after Elizabeth came, she had screens put in and then when Mary Ruth inherited the house, she had uh, better frames put in and then had the storm windows that put in. Gotcha. This piece here, when they were cleaning out things and getting ready for auctions, uh, one of our uh, helpers here, one of our docents, uh, he saw this piece on the trash. He asked about it and they said, we're going to dump it. And he said, well, I'll take it home and fix it. So he took it home and he, this is what he did with it and they used it. Uh, then he did some research and found out that it belonged on a uh, wagon. Gotcha. Because of the curve here and it would set back against the curve of the wagon. Oh God, so, so it fit. Yes, it fit, yes. Huh. So he generously brought it back to Mount Oval for us to use. Awesome. So we welcome you to our bedroom. We call it the honeymoon suite because there were two people who celebrated their honeymoon here. The first ones were Daniel and Julia Ludwig. His father bought this in 1860 and mm -hmm. gave it to them. Some people say as a wedding gift. Some people say just gave it to them um, in 1863 when they got married. They then honeymooned in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they went to the Mitchell Furniture Company where they brought up this bedroom suit, which is walnut, so we have the bed. Uh, sometimes it's called the Lincoln bed, only because Mr. Lincoln had a high uh, back as well. Uh, the dresser, the washstand, the dresser, the extra table that has a dog carved in at the bottom. Oh wow, that's neat. <laughs> and then they anticipated having children, so they brought up a crib as well. And the story that goes with this is that they lived here for 20 years. They had four children. Uh, they had a three, and the third one was a boy. And then there was a little time lapse, and then she was pregnant again. So they told the boy, you know, we're going to have another baby. And he said, well, I don't want another girl. If it's a girl, I'm just going to kill it. Well, 
of course that didn't happen and so when the third or the fourth child was born which was a third girl the father took the baby into the living room and gave it to this little boy and said here she is how about since it's a girl you name her and so he named her Lizzie Bell which later becomes Elizabeth gotcha so she's the one then who came back in 1915 and she wasn't killed no not at all <laughs> okay so uh, let's go into this nursery. This is the other, the second 10 by 10 room from the architectural drawing. Gotcha. And it was the nursery. So this crib was brought up on the canal, as was all the furniture. And the canal, just so you know, is across the street here, across 23 on the Scioto River at the time. So in this room, we also have a lot of clothing that belonged to Lizzie Bell during her time. And her little picture is up here. And of course, she becomes Elizabeth. This little bin was made for her from Walnut on the Farm. <laughs> and this day bed would have been on the front porch, on the porch that you just came from for probably one of the uh, cattlemen. Gotcha. Well. And then we have pictures of the canal here because so many people don't know about it. So it just helps with our story. We do have some antique quilts. They were uh, purchased by Mary Ruth at different points. The only other thing that's in here is um, this dress was given to Mary Ruth at age eight when she first came here, and she was told it had French knots, which actually is an embroidery term, the little knots, and she thought it meant it was from Paris, so she thought she was very special. <laughs> and I think I said this was made for Elizabeth, this was made for Mary Ruth when she came at eight. Gotcha. Since you're from Maine, you'll like this. <laughs> These are two of our oil lamps, and when I went to Maine a few years ago, and well, I went to um, Cape Cod, and then I went to the Sandwich Oil Lamp Company in, mm -hmm. the, in Sandwich. And these are double, so that means they gave twice the light at the time and they did not have a chimney. Hmm. These are from 1832, so they're very precious to us. Amazing. Again, another fireplace in the room. Right. Okay, so we're going to go in, I think, this way to the parlor. Awesome. Are you... Nope. Oh. <laughs> You'll meet Gail. Okay. All right, Gail, you ready for me? I am ready. All right. Yes. Go ahead. This room was originally called the receiving room, and they would receive their guests through this door here. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it was a more formal affair, they would take them through the door over here and into the formal parlor, parlor and that's where they would visit or uh, conduct their business. Gotcha. Um, as you notice, the fireplaces are, are facing each other. Again, symmetry. Okay, you got one on this side, and uh, yeah. yes. we'll turn around and get one over here. And each fireplace has um, a chimney covered on, on each, each side to make it, um, again, symmetry. And things that we like to point out here in the um, receiving room is the picture over the mantle. A local artist, Betty Griffith, did that for Mary Ruth Tolbert in 1963. It looks like a, a water painting, but it's actually oil. Hmm. Wow, it's beautiful. And then over the Davenport, we have an etching. Okay, I'm gonna make it there. Oh, okay. And it was done in 2007 by Mr. Uh, Rigsby. That one's hard to get on camera. Is it? Oh, it's yeah. so gorgeous. It is, it's pretty. It's just so it's going to be one of those ones you have to see to see. Yeah, okay. Versus. Okay. And beside the, uh, beside the um, etching, we have a picture of Mary Ruth's Talbert. That was the last picture taken of the Talbert family uh, before her parents, or before her um, father got killed. Gotcha. Yeah. We are told that uh, we are very blessed to have the folding doors still in place. They are not really that unusual, but most people in time would remove them. They still they still work, and we have used them before. Oh. Yeah. Wow. In the dining room area here, we have Mr. Rennie's original desk, and uh, it was out in the school uh, the uh, scale shed, and Mrs. Young brought it in and had it redone, and. It has been there since that time, since 1915. 
uh, it was a desk that you sat down and did all your work with. Uh, we do have a lot of his original work, uh, but the pages are kind of brittle, so we haven't found out how to uh, get a fix so we can display some of them. But oh. he had all the names of the cattle, and so when they sold, how much they weighed, and all that in his original hand uh, writing. Wow, that's neat. Uh, Mrs. Young was very instrumental in the Girl Scouts here in Pickaway County. And in 1952, they gave her a big party uh, for all her work and accomplishments for, for the uh, Girl Scouts. So this tray was presented to her and engraved her name and the date of 1952. Another thing we're very proud of is this plate and you can see we have a lot of naughty children and we have a lot of adults trying to control these naughty children. <laughs> so early on in Mary Ruth Talbert's life, uh, she was teaching in Columbus and they asked her would she go into this um, classroom because a couple teachers had refused to go back. The children were so misbehaving that they just gave up on them. So she says yes. And she goes in and she says, I'm here to teach, you're here to learn, I'm not putting up any shenanigans. So uh, the school year goes on, the children did uh, calm down, and at the end of the year, they presented her with this plate. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. The uh, clock on the mantle is original to the house as well. Yeah, that's 1952, huh? Yep. Wow. It's gorgeous. And yeah. yeah, I think that's all that we do. Somebody talk to she'll talk. <laughs> <No>. All right. <laughs> so we continue to here. We do have a second floor in this house, and we've just opened it this season. And we invite all of our visitors to see it. We will not be going up there today. But we do have a bedroom up there and then some more steps that go to a study that Mary Ruth used. So it's kind of interesting. Thomas Jefferson said that you should build steps very narrow and very steep so the guests didn't go up. And these steps are very narrow and very steep, but we have lovely, lovely woodwork here on the outside as well. Beautiful. So if people were interested in coming and doing a tour, um, this year or whatever, you guys have an event coming right up, right? We also do tours on the first and third Saturday mornings at 1030. We ask that you re have reservations through the Historical Society, and um, then we're, we're out here to do tours. We also do private tours, so if you call the Historical Society, we can get one um, scheduled for you and your group. And um, we have an event coming up in September the 15th, where we will have uh, tours of the house as well. It's our fall festival and campfire days, and it's a fun group event again, so we do appreciate that. All right. This room here was, um, as far as we know, it was always a guest room, but probably earlier on, they used it for their children. And we had a, um, an architect came out early as we were opening up, and he said because the fireplace was so large, it might have been used at a kitchen for a kitchen at one time. Hmm. It is big compared yeah, to all. Yeah, it's very big. Yeah. So uh, we decided to make this a Mary Tal Mary Ruth Talbert's room as um, honor to her for giving us this wonderful gift to Pickaway County. So all the things in here, except for the table, um, are Mary Ruth Talbert's. Um, Personal things. Personal items. Personal items. And we have a lot of her um, certificates and awards uh, placed up here as well. Oh, wow. You'll notice here in this last front cupboard uh -huh. are some uh, antique instruments. Mary Ruth collected those. And she also played them. And she did teach some of her students to play them as well. The dulcimer up there on the top shelf, she mm -hmm. had made. Uh, she had made a trip down to Virginia, and they had played the dulcimers, and she loved it so much. She had two of those made for herself. We have um, over here. 
when she was 11 years old, she was the healthiest girl in Pickaway County. And as a result of that, she got to go to the Ohio State Fair and give her little spill. And um, she took this cup and she, her, her little talk was uh, how to get your children to drink all their milk. You put a coin in the bottom and if they drink the milk, they got to keep the coin. Huh. <laughs> so as a result of that, also they was asking her questions as well. And she says, and I have a job too. And they said, what is your job? I have 52 ducks that I feed every morning and every evening. And she thought that was the thing that really topped it off. And she got a trip to Chicago and her aunt was able to go with her. Hmm. Healthiest girl in the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Funny. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. A lot of neat things. And we'll go here to the main bathroom. Okay. Okay, we're going into the main bathroom here. It was originally like used as a closet. It's a 10 by 10 room. Uh, but when Mary Ruth came back in 1967, uh, she added it as a bathroom. Hmm. She put all the, um, originally there was a tub and then later on as she got to where she needed a shower to get in and out, the tub was removed and uh, we put the shower in. The a three cornered cupboard also was found out in the scale house and it is hand honed and we think it is uh, also original to the Renicks. Hmm. Gorgeous. Amazing. Okay. All right. Yep. All right, let's do this. <laughs> okay, now we're entering to the kitchen. And this kitchen was always a working kitchen. However, um, you might want uh -huh. right? As you come in this door, there was a breezeway that went all the way through to the stairs up here. So when the farmers had to stay overnight, they could come in and go to the bunk room without disturbing the family. Uh, when Mrs. Uh, Lovewood came back in 1915, she wanted a large country kitchen. So she had the breezeway taken out and she had the steps refigured so that they could still be used. And she had the wood part of the house brought up to the bricks so she could have her large country kitchen. <laughs> the jog that comes out was not there at that time. So that's, she had all this space as her kitchen. That's hmm, neat. On the east side was the original fireplace where the cupboard, the glass cupboard is. Okay. So there was an original fireplace there? There was an original fireplace there. And it's not there anymore? It is not there anymore. Uh, so they, when they took that out, they put in a wood stove. And Mrs. Lovewood used that. Uh, and, and Mrs. Young, as she got married, used that for uh, until early um, 1950s, I think it was 1952, um, they were bringing the electric lines in uh, and they asked Mr. Uh, Young if they could bring the line across their property. And eventually uh, they worked it out. And so Mrs. Lub uh, Mrs. Young at that time agreed to have a little bit of electricity brought in. And so late then a, a little bit later, they talked her into an electric stove, and that was the only, they only had a very minimal uh, electricity though, because she still wanted to be the country lady. When Mary Ruth Talbert inherited the house in 1967, she did not want to be the country lady any longer. She wanted modern convenience. So she brought water in, and she added to the electricity and she since added to the electricity throughout the years. She wanted a sink, she wanted a dishwasher, she wanted running water, she wanted to be able to have a better refrigerator and life just a little bit easier. She uh, removed the 
linoleum that was in here and she had this put down and this is what was this is the only thing that has been um, redone since that time except in regular maintenance gotcha. and if you want to look at the picture behind you that was the linoleum here that she had taken up gotcha Okay. Be careful, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. This is our southeast porch, and uh, it, of course, it was always open <laughs> to the kitchen. But Elizabeth wanted to make it as much like the other porches as possible, so she brought in some very skilled workmen workmanship, and they tried to do the barrel ceilings, which they did do. Gotcha. Uh, a very fine, um, a very fine job, actually. Also, they left the air vent on the end of this porch as well. Just to make it unique with the other, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. And then later on, uh, in the early 60s, Mary Ruth had the, uh, oh, excuse me. Aunt Elizabeth had the floor put in, it's a cement floor. Mm -hmm. I guess it was open, and then Mary Ruth had a glass in. And what about the doors? The door goes down to a cellar, uh -huh. and that was the root cellar, also the canning cellar. And at one time there was a fireplace down there for cooking as well. Right, to cook the can and all that stuff, yes. right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, later on, Mary Ruth uh, had a washer put down there, and that's where we uh, did the laundry. Hey you guys, you did the laundry when you lived here down there? <laughs> yeah, and she, and you know, she did the laundry too before that. And we just hung it out there on the line because she thought a dryer was something that she... It's frivolous. <laughs> yes. Frivolous. It's frivolous, yes. Yeah. Um, so the construction of the basement, is it, is it, is it block or is it rocks set in cement? Uh, both. 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 Okay. Yes. I was curious. Yeah. Okay, we welcome you to our smokehouse. It too was built in 1832 by William Rennie. You notice it has very Virginia architecture. And if you visit some of the plantations along the James River and other places in Virginia, you might see the same kind of building. So we'll come in. It's a little dark, but come on in. The smokehouse, uh, you can see the rafters. And so meats would be hung here and smoke would be made here in the middle and it would be just used as smoking all the meats because there was no refrigeration. The second beam here is an original. It fits. The others are very old but probably came from other barns that were once here. Uh, they don't exactly fit but they were used for a long, long time. Hmm. For uh, smoking? Yes, for this purpose. Hmm. So that means that maybe some of the others broke. These uh, beams are all hand-hewn. You can see the axe marks. Yep, I can. And we had a man who was a barn expert come in and talk to us about all this. So in here we just have put some of our antiques that we have. And we have uh, screens on the windows to keep the birds out. And then the, and the holes on the barn, they were used for basically for the smoke to... Exhale. Exhale. Yes, exactly. Oh, neat. And then keeping this at a smoking uh, temperature rather than a fire, you know, took a little work, but it works. Hmm. So this is the Mount Oval Barn. It too was built in 1832 by William Rennick, same year as the house and the smokehouse. Um, it wasn't all built here, but the barn was built over to this beam. Then this bump out was added later, we think in the 1860s. Okay, remember that William Wenick was a cattleman, so he needed his barns as well. But we have a lot of antique um, farm implements in here. Many of them were given by the wool-overs, and we appreciate that gift so much, and others were given by other people. So we're happy to have these. We use them, of course, to explain to children what goes on in the world in the old days before tractors that were air-conditioned. <laughs> um, there is a granary, 
and above it would have been hay storage. Okay, so this is the granary and then above it would be the hay storage? Correct. The little alcove there was for the horse carriage. And, and it has its own door too, so you didn't want to open the big doors. Oh, okay, I see it back there. Okay. You could just bring out the horse carriage. I just made that up. I'll cut it out. Is there a door behind there? Yeah, there is. Yes, there is. There's a little door on the side. Gotcha. Did not make it up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so after this was put on, one of the things it had was it had a hole here in the floor. And then you could take the hay or the grain and put it down there for the cattle. Because there's a second floor underneath because the Because there right? was an underneath floor that where the cattle could come in. So, so that's how they fed them every day. They would just throw, throw hay down the hole and the cattle knew that the hay was there. Exactly. Gotcha. <laughs> Simple, but effective. So when we first got the barn, uh, we had to upright it a little bit because it was very sagging. So we had a company come and do that for us. And then we asked them to take all the flooring, some of which was unsafe, uh, out and replace it, but to put the, the original floor boards that were safe here in the front. So we're happy about that. So this is all original board. Right. And then that's where it transitions out. We have little corn, corn kernels here because we had an agriculture day. We had our corn um, sheller working so <laughs> the kids could have come and figure out what that was all about. Huh, that's And fun. our corn sheller is right back here in the corner. That's just that guy right there. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Thank you lower barn and I told you that the grain would have come down and the hole for that would have been about right here and so then the cows would have just come in here. We redid this a few years ago. Uh, this was all full of past cow stuff and, <laughs> and mud and that kind of thing. It didn't get water but that was the kind of thing it was because it, was, it had been used for all the livestock. So we redid it and had it concreted and so we can use it for events and then we put screens on the um, outer part on the windows so that we didn't get the birds but if you look at the beams you can see the beams yeah this one still has bark on it yes a lot of them do so these were all hand hewn at the time and those are original so and all that is the person that helped do the barns donated this cow extension to us where cows would come in and, and stand in those just so we would have one <laughs> And Mary Ruth Tolbert was an excellent horsewoman. She won a lot of um, trophies and ribbons. Uh, there was a Chillicothe horsewoman's horse person's uh, organization, and she was very big into that too.